one one it's December 6 and you know let, let's lighten up this page here shoot the juice to me Bruce well here we are it's times times three can't believe it it's December 6th already well, we, we've done a lot of these already we have and here we are again sipping coffee is Don Sherman and our resident poet and Hollywood historian Harry E Northup is also here with the blue LA uh, Dodgers cap, maybe soon to be uh, Magic Johnson's team. We hope. Magic Johnson's gonna own that team from baseball I, to baseball. I think, I think that will happen somehow. I think he's the man. Today you said is a six. I remember uh, tomorrow is a seventh, and that uh, my oldest brother was at Pearl Harbor when it was bombed, and he was on the USS Aramapo oil tanker, and he didn't get hurt. And they still get together. He didn't get hurt at all. No. Did, did, did the ship go go get get sunk or just hit? Well, it was still there. But he said, you know, the planes were flying over him. He said you could throw a baseball and hit him, and then he, you know, he's a real right wing guy. But it kind of touched me because he said he saved, he found a, a page from a Japanese pilot's diary. He had it translated, and that moved me that he found and kept that piece of diary. But thank God that uh, did the, this wife ever get that diary back? Uh, the, he kept it. I don't Love. know what happened. To him. Love. I was in Pearl Harbor too for two years, but I used to look across and see where the Arizona was. You in Pearl Harbor? I worked at yeah. I worked at Pearl Harbor. I was a radio operator in the Navy. How old were you? I was well, I was probably 18 when I got there. I was there from 18 to 20. So you signed up for the, the war. The war. No, I, I signed up at the Kitty Cruise in 1958, and I got out the day before I was 21 in 1961, three, uh, three years. So that explains your love of Hawaiian shirts. I love Hawaii. Kitty yeah. Cruise, Kitty yeah. Cruise. Yeah. Little, the little Kitty yeah. But you know, I was there two years, they wouldn't let us come stateside. And I, you know, afterwards I was offered jobs to be a radio operator on islands, you know, Kwajalein. But I, I couldn't stand to live on the island. You got you know? island fever, yeah, did you? Get you get island fever. That's yeah. what they say. They, they get rock fever and they got to get off the island and they got to go into the mainland yeah. and then come back again. They wouldn't let us go stateside. You know, what? they call the, uh, Hawaii the big island. They call America the big, big island. I was there when it became uh, a, a state. state. I don't yeah, know, 1959. 1959. Yeah. Uh, I was I grew up on an island, born on an island, so yeah. I never noticed that. Wow. But people say that uh, if you go to move to the island, you get island fever. Well, how long, how far are you from the coast where you grew up? Oh, I was I could ride on my bicycle down to the beach. You know, it's so a cute I little. Island. I mean, like from the island to the mainland. Uh, it was about 90 miles to the mainland by by water. And how how many years you lived there? Uh, Thirty. Well, as huh? as 30, 30 years. 30 years? Yeah. Until they could not pay the rent anymore. The rents got too high, right? They moved you out. They threw you out. They moved me out, yeah. Yeah, actually, I went, I left Victoria. It's a place for gardening, Victoria. That's the most well, that is the gardening beautiful place. gardening I've ever seen in my life. Absolutely world. beautiful. They, because they, they, they have their, the, the big attraction there is called Boucher. Boucher? Bouchard Gardens. Bouchard. Bouchard Gardens. And the cruise ship people only want to see the bootshot gardens. Well, they're seeing something and, worthwhile. And you get mesmerized by those gardens. Are they as nice as the Bronx Zoo gardens? Better. Better than the Bronx Zoo? Absolutely. I've been to oh, both, so I can tell you. Well, Does it way. snow up there? No, I mean, uh, rarely. Really? It, it will, but, uh, but back to the Bronx gardens, I mean, those are beautiful. Yeah, when, when, but Bootshart has, has it over. Kid, I used to play hooky and go to the zoo. Go to the zoo. It is beautiful there. Probably. And I found that my favorite visit to the zoo was to see the hippopotamus. <laughs> and just to see him sitting there with his nose halfway in the water. And he sits there the whole day and just grunts away. Well, well it's one thing the, the butcher gardens don't have, and that's a hippopotamus. They, they have animals? In the no, <laughs> they have no hippopotamus. No, hippopotamus. So, no. No, that, just flowers. That, that's my favorite guy to visit. And during feeding time, about 5 o'clock, boy. Does that zoo go crazy? What a cacophony of sounds. You know, what my a symphony. You know, my symphony of feeding time. You know, my favorite seventh grade joke is. Seventh? <laughs> What's that? <laughs> this guy's driving a uh, convertible on the Santa Monica freeway with five penguins in it, and the CHP pulls him over and he says, I want you to take those penguins to the zoo. All right. So the next day, the same cop sees a guy 
driving with the penguins in the convertible, all, and all the penguins are wearing shades. And he pulls the guy over and he says, I thought I told you to take those penguins to the zoo. And the guy says, I did. And they had so much fun. Today I'm taking them to the beach. <laughs> a seventh grader told me that. He likes to uh, tell jokes. Yes, of course you can. <laughs> most, most, most actors, they don't like to tell jokes, yeah. but you, you like to tell jokes. Well, I don't tell them as good as you. You're the genius yeah, I comic. Uh, I, I don't tell, to tell jokes, actually. I, I, tell, I tell stories, and in the stories I find little joke references. You know? Yeah, it was Henny that told jokes. Henny, boy, he told them one. And yeah. Myron yeah. Cohen, too. But, yeah. It was, it was fantastic when Henny uh, Edelman got so old and so sick that they'd wheel him out and they got rid of him. And his fans knew him so well that he would say a straight line and they would say the punchline. Punch. Oh, yeah. And laugh like and crazy. And have a great time just saying the punchline, knowing his act. So they're, they're, there's more to just laughing at a guy as he's sharing them because of kind of love that they're all laughing and takes them away from all their miseries in life. It's a great thing left there. Well, comes out of adversity humor, huh? So, I don't know what it comes out of. I, 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 I sometimes, you know, I, I've been doing it for 50 years. Sometimes they get up on the stage and I wonder, are they really going to laugh? And they've laughed the same, at the same moment, at the same time for the past 50 years. And by God, you get up there and you do it again and they laugh again. And, and if, if you don't say the joke, they get mad at you. Yeah, yeah, or off you forget it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, look, you have... Today we have psychologists. 2,000 years ago, the two ways of healing were either drama, where you have pity and then a catharsis for the characters, or humor, right? They lift you up out of yourself. There was a guy who had yeah, court cancer, justice. a writer, uh, and he wrote a book about that. And he treated himself. When he got a diagnosis of cancer, he just got rid of only comic books and funny... Oh, Norman Vincent Peale, wasn't it? Yeah, no, not Norman Vincent Peale, but in a name like that, you get three names. And uh, he, he cured himself of, of laughing because, you know, you laugh at life. Uh, we were, we were just, just talking like the effect Viagramas have on folks who have to now adapt their, their sexual unions to a, to a time schedule. You know, because you, you, you take the pill and then there are different doses of the pill, so you never know how strong a pill you should take because you've never taken this before. So you take this pill and then it, you, you got you're supposed to wait an hour for the pill to find out that wake everybody up. Hey, we're going to be doing that stuff again. And then uh, uh, you got to wait, 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 wait an hour for the settle in. And then you got your play, play time, you know. So you gotta arrange your life, your household around it. You're married, you know, you never have a time, but hours. So you have to start at a certain time and end at a certain time. Come on, hurry up before the time runs out. It's, yep. It must be so, so, so difficult. And, and, and the fact of that, that they, that they say in the ad, they said this does not help you avoid a venereal disease. So it'll help you in your sexual accomplishment, but <laughs> performance, you man. Around with the wrong girl. Has it affected yeah. your vision? No. Yeah, you're supposed to get blue vision or something. Really? Yeah. You're kidding. It says if you get you, you start seeing blue, you're taking too much. Well, I or haven't something. started taking it yet, but I'm I'm uh, they, they, I, I just got me instructions about what it is. Maybe um, maybe you would just have it on the nightstand. That's all, and just look at it. <laughs> it gives you the idea. Is this what I have to look forward uh, to? It's perception. I, I didn't know it was various. It was because of your wife that we were discussing. <laughs> I, I didn't know that they they have various strengths and potencies to it. Ah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's age-related. But it's a fantastic thing because they air after a while. People are taking pills for tears. People are taking the pills to sort of throw up. People are taking pills for everything they do in life. They take up their pill for it. Yeah, restless one, leg syndrome. One of the first jokes I ever wrote for the Playboy Club. It's, it's in the first, first or second magazine. I said, I had pills to pair me up, pills to calm me down. The guy asked me how I felt. I said, I don't know. I forgot which pill I took. You know, you gotta remember what pill you could take the wrong pill. Well, you have to take a pill to remember things. <laughs> Chips That's an airplane, remember? That's why the old White people rabbit. have a, there is a big problem with elderly people taking their, their, their pills at a certain time. And, yeah. So uh, you have a pill you take, so you remember what pills you took. Because you You're able to count so, them up. So that then you know how to feel. Yeah. You know? I take like blood pressure and a couple others, and I always write down so I 
don't really uh, don't forget. Why do you think you take a blood pressure pill? I'll tell you why, because I was getting ready to do a TV series called The Court, and they had to insure me, and my blood pressure, because I got in an argument with my wife over who's going to do the laundry the day before I went to work, it went above 180, and they told me I had to get uh, medication and it, before they would insure me. Over so, the laundry, your uh, pressure went up to 180. Yeah. Anyway, so they, that, I started taking it for that reason, but I always get hyper the day before I work. And then when I was in costume and uh, makeup, everything was fine. But the day before I work, I always get hyper, you know? Yeah, everybody does. Yeah. But, everybody does. I, I, I once asked Tony, Tony Bennett, I said, I, I always feel like a little sick, sick in my stomach, action. He says, no, that's energy. If you didn't have that, you'd die. Sometimes when I'm getting ready to do a poetry reading, I don't do this with acting. I almost get like flu-like symptoms. I think I, I can't, I don't know. Yeah, actors can't be exposed to live audiences. <laughs> They just gotta see celluloid, they gotta have a retake, they gotta have a cut. You can't subject an actor to doing the line and being subjected to just that line is just as it is. It can't be changed, turned, twisted. Now Don, you yes. know, who was when you were young, like who was What do you mean when I was young? No, yeah, when you there were young. guy's or... 110 years old. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Who were one or, one or two of your favorite comedians? All comedians are my favorites, I really say. You like them all? Yeah, what the hell? What does book people have to go through? God, God. You like George Wallace? George, George Wallace is excellent, excellent comedian. He told a joke one time, I saw him, he said, black males should not have to pay Social Security Why not? because when they hit uh, 65, they die. So they never get a chance don't, to don't get Social critical, Security. Right? <laughs> well, he's not far off in some respect. No, they, they you know, they really should take the money that somebody doesn't earn. Well, you can't figure out how, they, how, they, how long they should have lived. But it's terrible. My, my, my father never got it. He died at 62. Yeah. See, he, he didn't get any anything from it. Were you a class clown? So where does all that money go? Congress gets it. Really? It goes back to Congress? I think so. I think it they've been robbing that debt kitty. To China. <laughs> China, yeah. They don't. They don't continue paying the wife. Is uh, no, D dies with that. Would be too considerate. Yeah, I, if you had asked your mother, she would have told you. If she you got nothing pension, for it. Like if, if you die, Maven gets your pension. If your pension is higher than her pension. Well, yeah. uh, she'll she'll get my my SAG pension. She won't get my after pension. Which no, I'm sorry, talking about Social mean. Security. Yeah. Go, oh, oh, she's in Social Security. She, no, you don't get that. She she don't get any of your pension when you die. She don't get anything from Social Security. Oh, yeah. 20, when I die, $2,500. Yeah. yeah. $2,500 you get if you die. Oh, good. From SAG, you get $5,000. Well, that's now, now, that's you're, now you're up to $8,000. You're going to have a hell of a funeral. I would. What a listen party. To this. I, I was thinking Find about having my body buried. How many buried, people you, you can invite now? But I thought the best thing to do is be cremated. A friend of mine, he died. He was a poet and he didn't have much bread, so Holly and I, we paid most of the burial things. So, uh, uh, family Armstrong down at the foot of Washington. So, the guy, when he's uh, giving me the info, he said, How much did he weigh? And I said, Oh, about 165. And I said, Why? And he said, Because if he weighs over 200 pounds, it's $45 more for the cremation. So, he joined the Dead Poets Society, I guess. <laughs> yeah, well, that's how you score, right? Dead artists. That's where the artists go up there. It, that's right. Yeah, you know, the Dead Artist Society. What? what I don't. Uh, I don't want to join. Them. What artists did you like when you were young? A couple but, of artists. Did you have any favorite artists? Yeah, you know, growing up in Canada, it's uh, what they call the Group of Seven, which were seven Canadian impressionists that uh, early 1900s became quite prevalent. And, the Toronto Is that area. Cubism and all that stuff. That no you... impressionism. And they were doing landscapes of uh, the Algonquin lakes and uh, you know scenes around Quebec and uh, rural scenes. So beautiful, beautiful paintings. Sitting out there by the lake, just painting away. What are oh, yeah. one or two of their oh, names? names. Uh, Tom Thompson was probably the most famous. Uh, A. Y. Jackson uh, is another famous one. Uh, uh, Emily Carr. Uh, they, they have one section of the New York Times that's all artists and sculptors. Yeah. I can't imagine anybody else reading that section, but uh, it was a big deal, art. Art. Well, it was a bigger deal then uh, than it is now. You know, we, we have too many distractions. Uh, art in Canada used to be a big deal in the 50s and 60s, uh, as I recall growing up. People don't, don't, don't turn to art as not, much Not now so much, for no. Recreation. No, because it's uh, everything's digital. 
So you, you've got the immediacy of uh, digital mediums. So because uh, there were two guests that used to come on every world cruise that I did, mm -hmm. and they they would redecorate the whole ship. Oh, oh yeah, they, yeah. You mentioned those fellows. They yeah, they decorate their halls. Well, what they do professionally is they go, go, go to hotels and do the interiors. The yeah. Interiors, the the paintings. Certain paintings they use. I wonder how they pick those paintings. Well, decorators. Uh, yeah. I remember when I was Take a kid, we color. had one painting up on our wall. It was a print. It was called the Lonesome Pine. It was just a tree up on a hill. Here's a guy surrounded by trees <laughs> in Nebraska. He bought a picture of a tree. <laughs> Yeah, but did you have a pine tree in Nebraska? Mm -hmm. I, I've never been to Nebraska, so I don't know. I, well, there are, you know, prairie, a lot of wheat these yeah. trees out there. Flat. God, but these days you can go on, the, you talk about digital, you could type in Blake, William Blake, and just look, you know, his engravings, you know, yeah, over that's and right. over. Yeah. yeah, he was a, a prodigious uh, engraver and yeah. printer, book publisher, yeah. illustrator. And he died poor, died in poverty. He died like an artist, yeah. <laughs> you know, poor. You die like you live. Yeah, but they have fun artists. They, they, they live their life through their art. Well, they have no choice. I mean, you're an artist, you're born that way, you have no choice, you gotta do it. One time, uh, my wife and I, you know, she's a Jungian, so we went to a uh, Jungian uh, fundraiser at San Francis Studio around, I don't know, 20th and 30th, over around uh, uh, Broadway, Santa Monica. So mm -hmm. I walked in this one little room of his, and he had you know, all those little swatches of color. I thought, that yes. was beautiful, just to see all those little sections of color, yes. all the different colors. Mm -hmm. no, he was doing his printmaking there too, wasn't he? Yeah, and those big, yeah. you know, abstract. It's things. funny how they start children out very young painting. Oh, they're great. Drawing. Imaginative. Yeah. You would think there would be more painters and more artists. But then what happens, as they set the rules. said, to, to be a painter, you got to go back and recapture those youthful, Precisely. Worlds. Because once the child goes to school and it's their six or seven years old, then they say, well, okay, you got to put the color between the lines. You can't cross over the lines. Oh. And how could you have an orange banana? They're yellow. I mean, the rules start coming out. And the kid's creativity is like cut off, like right there. Because now it happens that way with poetry. It's adult too. rules. I, a friend of mine, he worked 28 years in a magnet school teaching poetry. And you look at the grade school kids, and they're all very imaginative. As soon as they hit junior high, their line starts becoming more prose like, yeah. and more descriptive and more intellectual. And they lose that imaginative thing. Yeah, it's gone. Yeah. And then, be, well, understand that uh, in the school system, you learn by rote. Not by thinking. School no free just, they just wanted to keep it quiet. You know? Yeah, it, was, it seemed as though it wasn't. Sit down, the shut up. Was keeping them in order. They had guys screaming at them and yelling at well, them. That's New York, Blackboard Jungle, where I grew up. I remember much quieter. Uh, I remember the teacher would be reading us from like Macbeth, and then behind, you know, in the, in the class we would be passing around Mickey Spillane, you know, my gun is quicker whatever with the good parts underlined. Today it's all been conflated. You don't have the high and the low anymore. I was always the you class know? clown because I threw two or three lines at the beginning of the season that made me the class clown. So they, they blamed me for everything, things that I didn't do. And they would send me down to clean the board races when they caught me at some. Well, that, that was a good job. Well, I liked it because it got me got out, you out of class. class but precisely. The, 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 the yeah. was punishing me. Did you go to DeWitt Clinton? No, that was all boys. They were mean and angry. Well, that's and a they famous had a terrible school. football team. James Baldwin went there. Frank a Orsero. good cheerleader would have softened them up a little bit, but they were all guys, and we had all the girls. So we'd bring them over. So our side of the field was all girls. Did you girls. graduate from high school? Yes. College. No, college, I went for one year to see. Well, seeing as you didn't graduate from college, Don, you're going to give us the word of the day as we close out. <laughs> the word of the day yeah. is... Uh, uh, law, I'm trying to think of a word. I can't think of that word. I can't Mischievous. It. No. Uh, Lion Thunder, the uh, uh, you got me. I tell you, this, this is a mega word. Big word. You better come up with a good one. Okay. Uh, 
Fantabulous. Okay, so today we say fantabulous to anybody who's watching. Fantabulous and, day to you. And goodbye from the West Hollywood Silver Spoon. <laughs> goodbye, it's a beautiful David day. And Have the Tom. rest of the day. And goodbye, Harry. And goodbye, David Glover behind the camera. And come back and see us again, please. See. Indeed. It's terrible to do this just for ourselves. Okay. okay. Goodbye. Thank you.